Okay, so uh, first, uh, someone asked me yesterday for, about uh, references. Uh, so here's a reference. This is a paper uh, on the archive, uh, a paper I wrote recently, uh, where you can find the definition of uh, open surfaces defined by uh, automata and uh, the classification of those surfaces, something I've been talking about yesterday. And uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about three manifolds, and, but it will, it will be mo mostly about compact three manifolds. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a bit more than uh, what I thought uh, initially. Uh, that's because, uh, as you will see, um, I will touch on subjects which are, which, um, are also um, interesting for Thomas' talk or Laurent's talk, and uh, even possibly for, to for, for courses uh, of the second week. So it's, in, it's interesting uh, to, to do this. So that's chapter two, that's so, uh, about mostly compact three manifolds. So, um, I'm going to, uh, to start with ciphered fiber spaces, or sometimes called ciphered manifolds. So that's a, an interesting uh, class of three manifolds. It was men mentioned uh, yesterday when I asked you uh, to give examples of, uh, of three manifolds, and you will see that it's a uh, it's a rather large class. It, it contains several um, examples, which are other uh, manifolds that some of you have mentioned yesterday. So uh, first, I'm going to give uh, three al alternative definitions of a ciphered fiber space. Uh, I will restrict uh, attention for, to the closed orientable case. For, uh, for a simplicity. I won't prove that, uh, that the definitions are equivalent. So, okay, so it's theorem definition. And, okay, so the first, uh, so the following three uh, assertions are equivalent. First, um, the manifold M is foliated by circles. Second, M is foliated by circles, so has a, a foliation by circles. Uh, with finite monodromy, uh, sorry, finite holonomy. And uh, three, if you know about all befores, then there is a a simple definition of ciphered fiber spaces is just uh, uh, fiber total spaces or fiber bundles with fibers uh, S1 and in the category of orbifolds, so over two orbifolds. And in case you don't know much about foliations or orbifolds, don't worry, uh, I'm going to give a concrete uh, description uh, of this, and this well, I won't need to explain this for the rest of the of the lecture. So that's that's the theorem and the definition is any manifold like that is called a ciphered fiber space. Uh, for short, uh, simply uh, a ciphered manifold. So uh, let me uh, give some explanations. So first, uh, the fact that one implies two, that is any foliation, say a smooth foli foliation of a closed free manifold where every leaf is a circle has to be of this special type. Uh, this is a difficult theorem by uh, David Epstein.
And uh, it's, not, it's not difficult to see that uh, 2 and 3 are equivalent, and of course, uh, 2 implies uh, 1. Uh, second uh, remark, um, we can actually give a, a more concrete definition in terms of local models. So, uh, so a, type, a Seifert manifold would be a, a, a union of circles. And uh, you can ask what, what does a neighborhood of a given circle uh, look like? And it turns, turns out that they look like this. So this is making more precise the, the idea of finite holonomy. So you start with a, uh, with a manifold, which is, um, sorry, it's a disk, a two disk cross an interval. Uh, which you foliate by uh, lines in a trivial way. So the subset of the form something cross zero one, one And then uh, you glue together uh, D2 cross uh, 0 and D2 cross 1. So, of course, you may do it trivially, and in this case, it gives a solid torus which, with a trivial uh, vibration into by circles. And uh, if you do this, then any manifold. Uh, foliated by circles uh, such that every circle has a neighborhood of this type would be simply a uh, S1 bundle over a surface, not an orbifold. But here you allow something more general. You uh, allow yourself uh, to, uh, to, the gluey map can be um, um, a rotation of finite, finite order. And, uh, well, of course, it, it can be the identity. And uh, what happens is if, if the, this uh, gluing map is not uh, the identity, then what will happen is that the central fiber corresponding to the center of the rotation uh, will be a so-called ex exceptional fiber. Uh, and this, uh, the, what happens is that uh, you, you start from there, then you follow the line, and then it closes up just once, after, after doing it, this once. But if you take another uh, fiber close to it, then when you come back, uh, you, it's not the same point because you, you do a, a rotation. But since the rotation has finite order, then, after finitely many times, you uh, get to the same point, so the, the leaves are indeed circles. Good. So now, I, want, I would like to spend some time discussing examples of cyphered fiber spaces. Um, and also, I will, I, will, so I will look at them from a topological uh, viewpoint, but also from a geometric viewpoint. And here you will see <coughs> some themes that occurred uh, this morning in, in Thomas' uh, lecture. All right. So I'm going to start with spherical manifolds. So, again, there are two definitions of uh, spherical manifolds. So, the first definition, uh, you can say that it's a manifold 
of the form you take S3 with the round metric. And then you take the quotient by a group gamma. And gamma should be a finite subgroup of uh, the isometric group of S3. Uh, and it should act freely on S3. And uh, the second definition uh, so it's just a three manifold, a closed three manifold uh, which admits a Riemannian metric. of a uh, constant sectional curvature which should be positive so for instance you can take it to be plus one everywhere and the equivalence between the two definitions uses uh, classical topology and uh, Riemannian uh, um, geometry so let me just uh, say briefly I, how it works since it will be the, the same for Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry. So, um, so first, uh, if you take a manifold satisfying the first definition, so uh, because since the group acts freely, the quotient will be a manifold in a natural way, and uh, the projection map will be a covering. And then you can uh, take the metric of S3, which has curv curvature 1, and it passes to the quotient, and you get this. And conversely, if you, if you take a manifold satisfying that definition, then um, the, the, the universal cover will be a simply connected manif manifold with a complete metric of sectional curvature plus one. As Thomas recalled ye yesterday, there is only one. The, this, so the universal cover of the manifold has to be S3. And you can lift the metric, and it gives the round metric on S3. And you can recover M uh, as uh, the quotient of, of the universal cover by the fundamental group. And the fundamental group is going to be a finite group acting by isometries. Right, so now let's give, give some uh, more specific examples. So of course, the first example is S3 itself. Then uh, another classical example is RP3. In this case, the group has two elements. Then uh, there is the, the Poincaré sphere. That was mentioned by one of you, I don't remember who. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, yesterday. So uh, I, I won't be, for, for this course, I won't be in, interested in this. So I'm just and I'm not going even to give the precise definition. I can just uh, give you one construction. So you, you can start from a dodecahedron. So I won't even attempt to draw a dodecahedron in, on the blackboard. And then you, you uh, identify uh, opposite faces in a certain way. And it will give a a manifold which uh, is the quotient of S3 by uh, some uh, finite subgroup of order uh, 120. So what is more interesting for, for us is that there, there are infinitely many spherical manifolds in dimension 3, which is not, was not the case in dimension 2. And uh, the easiest way to see this is, is to consider length spaces. So uh, lens spaces were mentioned this morning. 
So the, for every uh, pair of integers p and q uh, co prime, you have something uh, uh, length space LPQ. What is important is that the, the fundamental group of LPQ is um, a finite cyclic group of order p, and any p can be realized. So the, this group is always finite, but it can be of arbitrarily uh, large order. And this has the, consequen the consequence is that if you put on, on line spaces the metric of cu curvature plus one, um, then uh, it looks like this. So the first one is the sphere. And so suppose you take uh, um, a sequence of length spaces, so LP1, for instance, and you are interested in what happens when P goes to infinity. So you start with a sphere, and then they are thinner and thinner. And so they look like that, which is the way they are called length spaces. And uh, in particular, the volume uh, goes to zero. The, uh, this is clear because the volume is the, the volume of the sphere uh, divided by the, the order of the fundamental group, which goes to infinity. And so uh, you can look at gromov uh, asdorf con convergence uh, of this. And also the injectivity radius goes to zero. But the curvature is, is bounded. It's even constant. So uh, there is a proposition that says that all spherical manifolds uh, are Seifert manifolds. And in fact, this is not ob obvious. Because uh, well, on, on S3, uh, you have several uh, Seifert structures, but the, the, the most well-known one is the Hope vibration. So that's a map to uh, CP1, which is a two sphere. But uh, there is no reason the, why a finite group of isometries uh, should respect this, fi this vibration. In fact, in, in general, they don't. You have to go to either other vibrations. And so this uh, is kind of a, an accident. In fact, it's, uh, it's, it would be wrong for three orbifolds. That is, if you look at uh, groups that don't act freely, then uh, this, would be, uh, this would be false. But for many folds, it's, uh, it's true. And you can prove it using the classification. So by the way, I didn't, this is not a complete list of examples. There are other, other examples. There is another infinite family which are called prism manifolds. And then there are some uh, sporadic examples. So I don't want to go into the precise classification because uh, I won't uh, be interested in that. But you, you can do the classification, and then you can prove on all examples that they have safer fabrications. Good. So now, another type of geometry which corresponds to safer manifolds in dimension 3 are Euclidean manifolds. Or flat manifolds. So the, defi the definition is similar. There are two possible definitions, uh, either as a Euclidean space, which modded out by some uh, group of isometries, or a simply a flat manifold, that is, uh, manifolds that have a metric of a sectional curvature zero everywhere. And uh, it turns out that there are only six orientable uh, Euclidean uh, Euclidean three manifolds, and uh, I'm going to to give to um, to put as an exercise to f to to find them. So there is one which is easy to to find. It's the three torus. So that's just a product of of uh, three circles, and that can be uh, obtained in another in another another way by gluing. So just think of a cube. And then you identify opposite faces of the cube in a trivial way. And this will give the, the three torus. And uh, so exercise, find the, 
the five others. So, by the way, when I say exercise to find the five others, I don't mean to classify them, the, the, to prove that there are only six, because this will be more difficult. For this, you need to know, for instance, the, the, the theory of ciphered fiber spaces, but just to find as many of them as possible. So, it's possible to, to, uh, to look for them in an algebraic way or in a more geometric way by taking some polyhedron and try to identify faces. And in case you. Uh, uh, no, it's a six, six compact orientable. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, and if in case you uh, you want some help, you can get some help and also have a, a bit of fun uh, from the following website. So. Uh, geometrygames.org, so that's a, that's a web page where you can find uh, software for where you can uh, visualize some manifolds, so there are, there's plenty of interesting stuff here, and here you have to go to uh, something called Taurus Games. So by the way, the, uh, this uh, web page is uh, from, from Jeff Weeks. Uh, I will have some uh, <coughs> to, to mention this guy again. And so, uh, and so in, the, in particular, so Torres Games, uh, the, the first version, it was only in Dimension 2. So it was about uh, the, to the, the, the two torus uh, where you, you, can, uh, where you are in the square. And yeah, when you go uh, to the upper part, you, you come back to the, from, the, from below. And also the Klein bottle. But in the newer version, there, are, uh, there is also some three-dimensional stuff. Okay. Good. So that's all I, I want to say at the point from for um, flat flat manifolds. So let me go on with uh, other types of ciphered fiber spaces. So there is a, cl a class of ciphered fiber spaces which is not very interesting, but I have to mention them. And uh, there are there are only two of them. So S two cross S one with the trivial, the, the trivial uh, fabrication. And then there is a manifold, which is a two-fold quotient of this one, and can, can be described in several ways. And one of them is to take the connected sum of RP3 with itself. And uh, those are exactly the so-called reducible ciphered fiber spaces. So I'm going to define reducible later. Then there is a slightly more interesting uh, class which are of the type surface cross S1, uh, where F uh, is a closed surface. And uh, in order to have something new, I need to, to take the genus of the surface to be at least two, um, because uh, S2 cross S1 is, uh, I've, yeah. is already there, and um, T2 cross S1 is, of course, T3. But those are <coughs> okay. The, then you you can take at fi you, you can look at finite quotients of them. That's a, a slightly larger class. Then there are there's another interesting source of examples taking other fiber bundles. So again, yesterday someone mentioned uh, unit tangent bundles of surfaces. So again, let's say I have genus at least two because the unit, the unit tangent bundle of the, the two sphere is, is spherical and the unit tangent bundle of the torus, is the two torus is the three torus. But if you take uh, those, then they are non-trivial and as, so they are not homeomorphic to those ones. So there are new examples. And so that's, that's five uh, classes of examples. And I, did, I, I need a sixth one in order to really have 
uh, a good uh, general description, and those are called near manifolds. So I know that uh, Thomas, because he just told me, uh, is going to talk about this uh, may to maybe tomorrow or, or even, uh, even this afternoon. So I'm going to prepare, the, so I, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I'm, I'm going to give a, a, a definition and an example because it fits here. So to define a near manifold, so first you define the three-dimensional Eisenberg group. Which, uh, uh, which I uh, denote here by nil. So that's a, a matrix group. So you take the set of all three by three matrices of the form. So there is one on the diagonal, zero below the diagonal, and then anything, uh, real numbers. So let's say A, B, C in those places. So that's a, that's a Lie group, a three-dimensional Lie group. The group uh, low is just a multi multiplication of matrices. And um, yeah, you can always put a left invariant matrix on this group. For the moment, it doesn't matter which. And then uh, you have uh, you, near manifolds in this uh, in this restricted uh, setting are just quotient of uh, near by uh, discrete uh, groups of isometries acting freely. And uh, let me give one example which is simple to to define. The, so I won't. Uh, I won't, I won't take a notation. You take the group gamma, you just take the integral Eisenberg group, so that the same definition, but uh, this time A, B, C are integers. And you can check, so this is a subgroup of the Eisenberg group. So uh, the, the group nil acts by itself by left multiplication by isometries, because I put a left uh, invariant metric. And so in particular, this, uh, this is a, a group of isometries. Uh, you can check that it's discrete, that it acts freely, that it's co-compact. Co so it will give a closed three manifold. And it turns out that this metric, uh, that the C-manifold is ciphered five. Okay. So to to round up the, defini the discussion of surface fiber spaces, I'm going to draw a table. I'm not going to explain everything in this table. So it turns out that ciphered manifolds can be uh, divided I into uh, six classes, which uh, co correspond to the six uh, um, series of examples that I've just uh, given. And uh, so you, you need two invariants to distinguish between them. So the first one would be the, the Euler characteristic of B, uh, where B is the base or default. So if you don't know about or default, just think of the special case when the, the you have a fab, uh, S1 fibration and the base uh, uh, space is a surface, and then so you have, the, you have the three possibilities that the Euler characteristic is uh, negative, sorry, one usually begins with positive, uh, zero or negative. And then there is another invariant called the, the Euler number. I'm not going to give the definition because I won't uh, need it in the, in the sequel. So it's, uh, it can be zero or non-zero. And for instance, it is zero when, when the bundle is trivial. So, um, so the exercise is to, f to find out what, what are in the, 
in a, what you could, what you should put in this table. So I do it one one easy uh, easy part. So for instance, it's clear that Euclidean manifold should be here because the the simplest example is the three torus, and the three torus you obviously is a trivial bundle over a two torus, so it should be here. And so exercise. Uh, where are uh, spherical manifolds, where are nil manifolds, and so on. Yeah, so that's exercise uh, eight. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Question? Why the Euclidean type of fibers is can't have non zero Euler numbers? Yeah, it's not, it's not obvious. So actually, uh, uh, I think the only way I, I can prove it is you classify them and then you, you, you look at. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, well, uh, okay, so yeah. Your, your question is a bit different. So by, by classification, you can prove that every Euclidean um, three-manifold has um, um, uh, well, it, it is here. But th then there is another uh, point that is it, it should be possible, or it could be possible in principle that the same manifold has several ciphered uh, vibrations which correspond to different um, uh, in the inv invariants. So it turns out that this is not true. But the, again, it's not uh, obvious. It's something you, you, need, you, need, you need to work. So in general, the self vibration is not unique, but the, the type is, is always uh, unique. And so in, partic in particular, Euclidean, uh, they, they, cannot, uh, they cannot have a, a, a cipher structure with non zero. Uh, okay. So I don't know if there is an easy proof uh, of this uh, unless. Even if you do the, the whole theory of, of them. Right, so uh, next I'm going to talk about hyperbolic free manifolds. So that's about B. So uh, here I will discuss uh, both uh, com some compact and some non-compact uh, examples. But again, for, for simplicity, I assume everything is orientable. So uh, again, two definitions. So that, um, well, since it's important, I'm going to um, to, uh, to write uh, write down everything. So proposition definition. Uh, the following properties are equivalent. So one definition by group action. So, uh, so for a, for a free manifold M, uh, first M is diffeomorphic to the quotient of hyperbolic free space by a group gamma. Gamma should be a discrete uh, subgroup of isometries, and it should act freely. And second, uh, the manifold M admits a complete metric mm. 
this time of curvature uh, minus one. And definition, this, uh, this is called the hyperbolic three manifold. And I start with a remark. Uh, it's not so easy to construct a closed hyperbolic three manifold. It's, uh, it's rather harder than in dimension two. So yeah, let me give, no, not a full, uh, a full history of constructions, but at least a few uh, highlights. So again, here I am mentioning things which I won't uh, explain in detail. So here are some, some ways uh, to produce such many faults. So historically, not, not the, the, the first example, but one of the first examples uh, is due to uh, Seifert and Weber. So Seifert is the same uh, German topologist who studied the Seifert fiber spaces. He was also in, interested in other geometries. And uh, the Seifert fiber dodecahedral space. which is a kind of uh, hyperbolic cousin of the Poincaré do, do, dodecahedral space. So again, you start with a dodecahedron and you identify uh, opposite surfaces, but in a different way than the, the one that gives the, the Poincaré sphere. And uh, it turns out that it gives a, <coughs> uh, uh, a hyperbolic manifold. This is a rather, rather complica complicated. Then uh, I must at least mention the, another uh, source of example, which are ar ar arithmetic constructions. So the first, uh, the first one was in a paper by Armand Borel, and there are, there are others. Uh, and then there are uh, other methods, the one which is called the infilling, but the, the, the type of the infilling that you have to do in order to produce hyperbolic manifold was really uh, invented by William Thurston. And uh, so, um, uh, okay, so maybe I'll talk a bit about it later and then since uh, some of you uh, uh, mentioned mapping tori, so some uh, mapping tori uh, of hyperbolic surfaces are hyperbolic three manifolds. So again, so the, I think the first example is due, due to Johansson, and uh, the general theory is due to Thurston, and uh, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, theorem. Okay, so uh, I, I want to, to uh, mention a few uh, facts about uh, three manifolds, which I think are interesting. So, um, so first, there is a result, so I don't know uh, if it should be uh, attributed to Thurston or if it was known before. And, uh, and this is the, so here is a, uh, an example result. So you take the class of all hyperbolic three manifolds of volume bounded above by some constant, say 10. And uh, you look at this class, uh, modulo diffeomorphism, and uh, it is infinite. 
But this is in contrast with the two-dimensional case. Uh, remember, uh, one of the exercises of, uh, of yesterday was to prove that in dimension two, if you put a lower bound on the area, uh, sorry, an upper bound on the area, this controls the genus. So you have only finitely many possibilities. Well, if you take, put a, a number here big enough, 10 is not optimal. I can tell you the, the optimal value if you want. But uh, then uh, you, you, are, you will have infinitely many uh, manifolds and in fact infinite, infinitely many uh, values for the volume. So the, the values of the volume function uh, can, can have uh, accumulation points and it can even be described in a more precise way. And the proof of this uses um, hyperbolic Dane filling. So let me just say a few words about how this works. So you start um, say with a hyperbolic knot, so for instance the figure eight knot is a hyperbolic knot, that means that uh, so if I call k this knot then S3 minus k is hyperbolic. That's an example of a non-compact hyperbolic. And then what you can do is instead of saying say S3 minus uh, Minus k, you take the complement of an open tubular neighborhood of k. So this, okay, so the q of k is, is open tubular neighborhood. So this is a compact uh, three manifold with boundary of torus. So let's, let me call that m. And then you glue a solid torus to, uh, to this manifold. So you take M union solid torus, uh, glued on, on their boundary. And there are several ways to do the, to do the gluing. Uh, if you do it trivially, that is, if, uh, if you take S3, you remove a solid, solid torus and you glue back the solid torus in the same way, then this produces S3. But if you, if you do something more intelligent, then it will give uh, a more interesting manifold. And in fact, uh, one special case of Thur Thurston's Dane filling uh, uh, theorem is that, is that uh, there are infinitely, well, it's, it's even stronger than that, but in, in, in particular, uh, there are infinitely many hyperbolic manifolds which can be obtained for, uh, from this. And so you can produce an infinite sequence of hyperbolic manifolds, which are closed. And uh, in fact, you can uh, have more precise results. And you can look at the sequence of the volumes. And it turns out that this, this sequence is strictly, if, if, you, if, you take it, <laughs> if you take him in the right order, that this will <laughs> it will be strictly this, the, the increasing. And uh, it will actually converge to the volume of the uh, uh, figure eight knot complement. That's the picture. Uh, now let me state another theorem, which is more recent. So it's due to uh, Gabay, uh, Meyerhoff, and Millet. So I, I would like to, to point out that Dave Gabay uh, will be one of the speakers in the third week uh, work workshop. And uh, so I think around uh, 2008 or 9, I think 2009, uh, they, uh, they prove the, f the following theorem. Um, 
uh, if you take the infimum of the volumes of all hyperbolic three manifolds, orientable, then this is actually a minimum and it's uh, realized by something called the Wicks from Ecomet Bayef uh, manifold. And so it's the precise uh, value of the, of the volume is known. So it, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give the definition. This manifold can be defined by, uh, by a Dane filling on a link rather than not. And so So this was uh, discovered independently by Jeff Wicks uh, in the West and uh, Fomenko and Matt Veyev uh, in, the, in the East. So this is a certain closed hyperbolic three manifold and uh, the, the volume is uh, slightly less than one. So here, perhaps uh, a, a, a comment. So in particular, this implies that uh, this infimum is not zero. So that there, there cannot be um, hyperbolic three manifolds of arbi arbitrarily uh, small volume. But this was uh, known before by uh, Gajdan Margulis theory. So this is an application of what later would uh, be known as Margulis lemma. You will hear more about uh, Margulis lemma and generalization, generalizations la later. And, uh, and of course, this contrasts this with uh, spherical geometry. Uh, because we, we saw before that uh, land spaces have uh, volumes going to zero. Yeah, on the whitehead link. The whitehead link. I just looked that up in, in, in Wikipedia. I think it's four of, of no, it's five, five one, five, five two, <laughs> on the whitehead link. How much was the uh, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, you, it's probably on Wikipedia too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, are there other questions on hyperbolic uh, manifolds? Okay. So now, uh, what I need to explain is how you can get a general structure theorem, which is the geometrization theorem, uh, that says that essentially any closed uh, manifold, free manifold, can be obtained by surface manifold and hyperbolic manifold by uh, doing some combinations. So this will take some time. So here I'm, I'm going to introduce some, uh, some uh, fundamental results in free manifold theory. And uh, I, won't, I won't do uh, any proof because some of the results are, are difficult to prove and it would take me uh, <coughs> too much time. And I, uh, uh, I uh, recall that the, the, the main topic of this course is supposed to be open three manifold, so I don't want to spend too much time on, uh, on closed manifold, but I have to, uh, otherwise you wouldn't uh, understand why, uh, <coughs> why uh, open manifolds are different. So that's part uh, C of today. It's well, it's really uh, a whole set of results uh, that, that lead to the geometrization theorem. So uh, first I need to define what a connected sum of manifolds is. I used the, the notation earlier, so here, let's give the definition. 
So it can be given in uh, arbitrary dimension. I will uh, use it for n equals 2 and 3. And so uh, let's assume that m1 and m2 are uh, n-dimensional manifolds. And uh, we assume that they are oriented. And then what you can do uh, is you, 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 you pick uh, a free ball B1 in M1. So no, sorry, not a free, an N ball. That's a disk in dimension 2 or a ball in dimension 3. Uh, then you pick one B2 in M, M2. Uh, and then the connected sum, which is written like this, uh, is defined as, so M1 uh, minus the interior of B1 glued along the boundary uh, with uh, M2 uh, minus the interior of B2. And the glue in here should be uh, by a, a uh, orientation reversing um, homeomorphism of the boundaries. So first let me explain to, uh, what, what this gives in dimension two, two where it's uh, rather uh, easy to draw pictures and understand what's going on. So, uh, so the fir first thing that you, and, oh, okay, sorry. Um, here, of course, in this implicitly, I'm asserting that this manifold up to diffeomorphism is uh, independent of the choice of the balls B1 and B2 and the choice of the uh, gluing uh, homeomorphism. And this is not uh, obvious, it, it relies on classical theorems. And I, I won't uh, give any proof of this. So we just, we just assume that. So, um, okay, so in dimension two, well, first, if you take any surface and then you do a connected sum with a two sphere, then this will give back the same surface. So why? That's because, so let's take a surface. And then uh, I take the two sphere. And then I do the connected sum. So I remove a disk uh, from the first one. I remove a disk from S2. But then the complement of a disk in S2 is again a disk. And so what you are doing is removing a disk and gluing back a disk. And since uh, we know that this is independent of the gluing, then this is a trivial operation. So uh, maybe it's more interesting to do a connected sum of a surface with a torus. And uh, what, what it does is just add a handle. So that's the, that means that there is the formula. The genus of any surface uh, connected sum with T2 is uh, the genus of F uh, plus 1. Let me prove that by, by picture. So take a surface, say, of genus 2, for instance. Then you take a two torus, remove a disk, remove a disk, and uh, glue them back. So I can uh, draw it like this. So, so here's the, the genus two surface with one puncture. Uh, here's the uh, a, a torus with one puncture, and then you glue them back, and. Uh, uh, you have now three, uh, three handles. Okay. So in particular, that means that if you start with a hyperbolic surface and you do a connected sum with a torus or another hyperbolic surface, then you would get also an hyperbolic surface. So in dimension three, this is not at all like this. If you take the connected sum of two hyperbolic manifolds, it will never be hyperbo hyperbolic. So it gives uh, other manifolds. But in dimension three, it's, it's uh, still true that any manifold connected sum with S3 uh, will be deformific to the, the original manifold. And this prompts uh, the following definition. 
you say that a manifold is prime if it cannot decompo be decomposed as a uh, connected sum, ex except in this trivial way. So n is prime if uh, whenever uh, you can write uh, m as uh, so connected sum of two manifolds m1, m2, uh, we have uh, that uh, at least one of them is a sphere. And so it turns out that when you take ciphered manifolds or hyperbolic manifolds and you do connected sum, then you will get new manifolds, except in one case, if you do connected sum of two RP3s, then you get uh, ciphered manifolds. So this, uh, I'm going to state this uh, as a theorem. So this is a consequence of uh, something called Alexander's theorem. And so I'm going to state uh, two things. The first is that all ciphered manifolds are prime except what I just said. And uh, next one, uh, all hyperbolic manifolds Are prime. This time there is no exception. Good. Now there is a, another uh, notion which is closely related to primeness, which I'm going to, to need later, and this is irreducibility. So, definition a three manifold is called irreducible. if uh, every smoothly embedded two-sphere uh, in M bounds a sub-manifold which is deform deformorphic to a three-ball. And uh, for compact manifold, uh, this is almost the same as prime. The precise result is that M is irreducible if and only if M is prime and M is not diffeomorphic to S2 cross S1. So I can explain a bit why. One, yeah, one uh, direction is easy, uh, it's uh, this one. So think of it uh, as the contrapositive. So if, if M is not prime, uh, that means that uh, in M you can find a two sphere and uh, there is non-trivial topology on, on both sides. And in this case, uh, the manifold won't be irreducible. So it will. It's reducible. And also, if M is uh, diffeomorphic to S2 cross S1, 
Well, S2 cross S1. Uh, there is a, a collection of spheres which are of the form S2 cross a point, and those, uh, they don't separate the manifold. The, com the complement is connected. And uh, as such, such a, uh, because of this, such a two sphere cannot bond, bound a ball. So again, uh, S2, this means that S2 cross S1 is reducible. And, uh, but the converse is uh, a bit more difficult to prove. Sometimes it's left as, as an exercise, but uh, uh, well, you, you can try to prove it as an exercise if you want, but it's not uh, really uh, interesting from the perspective of this course. So you can also just uh, assume this. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so at this point, I would like to make a digression. I'm going to state uh, two theorems, uh, which are uh, mainly of historical importance. Uh, so the first one is the theorem of uh, Meek, Simon, and Yao. And uh, the, the, the statement is very simple. Uh, if M is irreducible, then uh, the universal cover of M is also irreducible. And uh, the second theorem uh, is due to Peter Scott. It's, it's about the same, uh, the same period, so that's in the, the early, uh, the la late uh, 70s or early 80s. And uh, so the, the, this theorem is usually summarized as saying that there are no fake ciphered fiber spaces with infinite pi 1. That's more or less the, tit the, the title of the, the paper. And uh, here's the precise uh, statement. So you take uh, two uh, manifold m1 and 2 so there should be three manifolds. They should be both uh, closed orientable. And you assume that one of them, say M1, is a ciphered fiber space. And uh, you, you, you assume that it is irreducible. And uh, that uh, it has infinite uh, fundamental group. And the fundamental group of M2 is the same. So the fundamental group of M2 is uh, isomorphic to the fundamental, sorry, sorry, pi 1 of M2 is pi 1 of M1, and you assume that this group is, is infinite. And then, and also you need to assume that M2 is irreducible. And the conclusion is that M1 is diffeomorphic to M2, and in particular, that, that shows that M2 is ciphered. Okay. 
Um, okay, a few remarks. The first remark, if you assume that both M1 and M2 are ciphered, then this was already known. So if I remember correctly, it's due to Orlik, Vogt, and Cixiong. So here the difficult part is that you assume that one is ciphered, but the other one could be any closed orientable manifold. You need to assume that it is uh, irreducible because otherwise you would, be, uh, uh, you would uh, have to face the Poincaré conjecture. So it would be hard to, uh, to deduce something about M2 just to win the fundamental group. Uh, by the way, now that we know that the Poincaré conjecture is true, we actually know that this hypothesis is, no, is not necessary. And uh, this is another reason why I, I said that they are historically important because once you know uh, the geometrization conjecture is true, uh, this becomes more, uh, more easier. So the, and this, this also. So th those are two theorems. Uh, it's, uh, they were difficult to prove in the, in the 70s because the geometrization conjecture was not known. And so what those two uh, theorems have in common? They have in common the, the method of proof and this is what the, the real reason why I am telling you about all this. Uh, so in both proof, the key ingredient in the proof are minimal surfaces. So although the, the theorems are purely topological in their statement, in order to prove them, uh, you use Riemannian geometry and you study minimal surfaces. So um, I don't know if we can uh, explain the, something about uh, this together with Laurent and minimal surfaces. So I think that the theorem of Peter Scott is too difficult uh, to uh, even summarize the proof, so I won't attempt to do this, but the theorem of Mick, Simon, and Yao, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, I think, an easy consequence of the hard theorem about minimal surfaces. So I think at least what we, perhaps what we can do is state a difficult theorem about minimal surface and explain how you deduce the, the theorem. So I don't know, maybe we're going to do this or maybe we'll do something else. But I, I wanted to mention this that minimal surface theory is, uh, is an important tool in, in three-manifold uh, three theory. Uh, that's the end of the digression. Okay, so now I must uh, state the geometrization theorem. So for the, in order to do this, I need one more definition. I need to define uh, an incompressible surface. So um, let's assume we have a surface F, which is smoothly embedded into a three-manifold M. And let's assume, well, okay, can be defined for, for other surfaces, but let's assume it's a closed surface. And again, everything is orientable. Uh, uh, so I'm going to say that F is uh, incompressible. If it is power one injective, that is, if you look at the, the homomorphism uh, from pi one f to pi one m, uh, which is induced by inclusion, and uh, you want this to be injective. And so uh, now I'm going to state the, geometric, uh, the theorem which gives a geometry decomposition. So I'm going to do this in two stages. The first one is actually a, a null theorem of Helmut Knezza from the 30s that said that uh, every uh, closed three manifold uh, is a connected sum
of uh, finitely many prime manifolds. So here, when I say finitely many, in particular, it can be more than two. So, uh, so what, what this means, so I, I haven't quite exp explained what it means. Usually, when you write this uh, like this, so you have a finite collection of manifolds, say a four. And then you, can, you do connected sums, the, the way I have explained. Okay. And again, the result does not depend on the, the precise path. So I could have connected this one first to that one, it would give the, the same. But you, you, uh, you, you cannot do this. You, you just do a, you, you take a tree. Uh, this will be important later because uh, later we will discuss infinite connected sums. So, but for finite connected sum, there is uh, no uh, trap. It's, it just works uh, uh, in this way. And so, so this theorem says that uh, every closed uh, manifold can be de described by a prime manifolds. And then you want to know how to decompose prime manifolds in two pieces, which are ciphered or hyperbolic. And uh, this is the, the theorem of Perelman, which uh, was Thurston's conjecture. So, uh, so it says that uh, any uh, closed prime orientable three manifolds. Uh, contains a collection of two tori so they should be disjoint and uh, such that Uh, the complement, so say the manifold is M, uh, the, the, the complement on, of the union of this tori uh, is, uh, consists of uh, ciphered fiber spaces um, <coughs> and the hyperbolic uh, pieces. And an important point is that those tori should be incompressible. So let me make a few comments about this. So uh, first, in order to this uh, make sense, you need to work with um, ciphered manifolds which are not closed. So they can be open or uh, compact with boundary. I have given the, the theory of, of closed ciphered manifolds. Uh, the theory of compact ciphered manifold with boundary is uh, a bit different. It's, a, it's not so clean as the, as the theory for closed manifold, but it can be done. And uh, uh, same for hyperbolic, of course. And then another remark, why it is important uh, to have incompressible tori. Uh, if you don't require the tori to be incompressible, then it, this was known before. 
But this would be a, a much weaker statement because you could not deduce the Poincaré conjecture from this. And so one of, one of the, the reasons is that uh, as a corollary, you get the Poincaré conjecture. That is, uh, if, if M is a uh, closed three manifold and the fundamental group of M is trivial, then M is deformorphic to the three sphere. And uh, so if you try to uh, deduce this from the, from the ge geometrization theorem, then uh, you will need incompressible tori, otherwise it, it, otherwise it won't work. Good. So I'm going to, to stop uh, here, but before we uh, stop, uh, let's have another activity where uh, uh, you should participate. So this will be both, uh, it will have to do something with, to do with what I said and something to do with what I would say tomorrow. And uh, it's, uh, the, the question is simple, which, which are the abelian three manifold groups? So uh, I need another blackboard. So, uh, so the question is the following. So let M be a pre-manifold. So it could be open or closed, or it could even have boundary if you want. And uh, not necessarily orientable. And uh, you take uh, a group G and you assume that it is isomorphic to pi 1 of m for some manifold m. And the question is, what can you say about g? Of course, there is another question, which is what can you say, uh, sorry, when uh, you, you assume that this group is abelian. Of course, there is another question, what can you, what can you say about m? But this is a, a more difficult question. You, you could answer this when the, in the closed case or in the compact case, but in the open case, uh, this, uh, this, this is not known. So, but let's, let's ignore this more difficult question. Just what are the examples of manifolds uh, that you know that have uh, a, an, an abelian uh, group? Let's see if you can, uh, so this, the, the classification is known. It has been known since the, the 70s. So uh, yeah, let's see if you can find them all. <laughs> the identity, the identity, I don't think it's a group, but of course, there is a something called the trivial group, which is uh, the fundamental group of the sphere. So it's, uh, yeah, that's a good example. Uh, a bit uh, larger, perhaps. <laughs> Sorry? I don't know. C3? Z? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, with the three uh, up, OK. <laughs> Yeah, of course. That's the fundamental group of the three torus. Yeah, of course. Okay, so they're not in the right order, but <laughs> never mind this. Yeah. Okay. Maybe some with tor torsion. There are, there are the, uh, the, uh, the, the cyclic groups, lens, lens spaces. OK, so we are missing a few. There is one which is not so easy, so a, a hint. Um, try to find uh, an, an interesting non-orientable manifold with an abelian uh, group. It's not, not, not difficult to uh, just think of a non-orientable surface, what you, you can do with it. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. You just uh, take uh, S1 cos RP2 to have this one. Well, this is a complete list. 
of the finitely generated ones. But there are also some infinitely generated ones, which are by ones uh, of open manifolds, but not of closed manifolds. So can you find some of them? This is more difficult. <laughs> François, François, perhaps? Yeah? That's one, uh, that's one example. Of course, uh, not just one half, you can have others. So that's an example of a rank one uh, infinitely generated abelian group. Uh, okay, m maybe I, I just give the results. The, the result is actually you can get uh, any subgroup of Q, Q itself, this one, and all subgroup. It's, uh, once you know that you can realize Q, then you take, you take a cover, you can realize any subgroup. And uh, I, t tomorrow I will explain how you, you get those groups. And this will be, uh, lead us to open three manifolds. Thank you.